name is Ben Marquez. Uh, I'm a professor of political science. I'm also the director of the uh, Chicano Latino Studies Program and a member of the steering committee of the Haven Center. And uh, we're here today to welcome Natalie Masuoka uh, and, uh, from Tufts University. Uh, she's a professor uh, of political science uh, and director of the Asian American Studies Program at Tufts. Uh, but before I give her a proper introduction, I'd like to point out that she's going to be holding a seminar tomorrow uh, at noon uh, in 336 Ingram. Uh, and it's an informal, informal seminar. It's there for questions and answers and discussions of her, uh, of her work. She has posted some material uh, on the Haven Center website, uh, three very interesting chapters from, uh, from work that she's published. Uh, so, uh, so please have a look at it and just come with your questions, and we'll have a, we'll have an open discussion. Uh, so, uh, uh, Natalie uh, is an associate professor of political science and director of the Asian Am Studies uh, program at Tufts University. Uh, her research specializes in the area of American racial and ethnic politics, with a focus on political behavior, public opinion, and political psychology. Her work pays attention to the ways in which race, immigration, and identity influence political attitude formation among racial and ethnic minorities. Uh, her first book, The Politics of Belonging, Race, Public Opinion, and Immigration, was the winner of the 2014 Ralph Bunch Award uh, by the American Political Science Association, uh, a very prestigious award. Uh, and it offered an analysis of public opinion differences on immigration across racial groups. I think that's the subject of today's, of today's talk. Uh, she has uh, published work in, uh, in journals like the American Politics Research, Perspective on Politics, the Political Research Quarterly, and the Social Science Quarterly. And she also has another book uh, already uh, about to go into production. Uh, so, uh, so please welcome uh, Natalie Masuoka. Thanks, Ben. Uh, and I want to thank uh, everyone uh, for the invitation today. Uh, it's been really uh, fun being here and talking about my work uh, for the last few days. Um, I guess I should note uh, there was a, a little bit of a change in uh, what we're going to talk about today. My, I, I thought I was uh, going to have a little bit of time to work on some of the extension uh, to uh, my uh, first book project on immigration. Uh, and of course, time got away from me, so I thought I'd take the chance to talk a little bit about uh, my work uh, on immigration attitudes uh, and variation across whites, blacks, Asian Americans, and Latinos. I think it's a, uh, it's really a, a pertinent topic, uh, really following the 2016 election. Uh, so I think um, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, really great to at least be able to share uh, some of the work uh, that's in this book. So really, um, how, how we started this uh, book is, is um, we had a, a lot of concerns about how public opinion generally, uh, but specifically when we talk about immigration attitudes, um, the uh, very, uh, we would argue, uh, narrow framework uh, that political scientists particularly approach uh, the study of a public opinion on immigration. Um, and so what I wanted to start off with is, is really showing uh, a very typical type of portrayal of how we uh, uh, present public opinion data. Uh, and so usually it is a national population sample, right, which is, you know, related, of course, to all sorts of various different uh, methodological concerns. Uh, but we present, right, could effect effectively average rates of opinion uh, uh, for the entire, as an average of the entire nation. Uh, and so when it comes to immigration, there's a classic question that's been asked by Gallup poll um, this actually is, is really just the 2000s here, but uh, Gallup actually asked this question going all the way back to uh, the 1960s and 70s. They don't, of course, take it every year like, like what I have here, um, but they've been asking it for, for quite a long time. Uh, so it's given us a longitudinal uh, pattern, which generally shows uh, that uh, at least half of Americans uh, prefer uh, that immigration be decreased in the United States, right? Um, another very large share uh, think that immigration should stay the same, and really only a small proportion, usually less than a quarter or so, uh, think that immigration should be uh, increased. Um, uh, immigration policy should be changed to, to be increased. Um, so a lot of times, right, we see these types of, of figures. Uh, it does tend to paint a picture uh, that Amer Americans are not necessarily uh, very aggressively interested in increasing the size of immigrants in the United States. Uh, and actually lean much more towards an anti-immigrant stance, or at minimum, uh, a more cautious stance towards immigration. 
uh, overall. Okay, now, uh, what my co-author and I, uh, however, uh, really started thinking about was uh, national population samples uh, do tend to skew uh, our views uh, about public opinion because in, in many ways they mass diversity uh, of opinion in the United States. And I think, you know, in many ways, um, the mainstream media has been really great about doing this, but they've been really uh, better about uh, disaggregating opinion. Uh, but historically, really, uh, when we think about opinion, we kind of only think about what the nation thinks as a whole. Um, and so one of the things that you could do is you could disaggregate um, respondents by their race. And so this is whites, blacks, and Latinos. Uh, unfortunately, uh, Asian Americans uh, are not large enough, um, at least, or easy. It, it, their, their size is related to kind of how easy it is to collect on a national pop sample. So in, uh, in terms of Gallup uh, data, we unfortunately don't have Asian Americans, but they trend somewhat closer to Latinos uh, on this chart. Um, so when you disaggregate by race, we actually see uh, some really important differences in uh, Americans' attitudes towards immigration. That actually, what we can see here uh, is whites, which is the dark, the kind of dark turquoise bar there on the top, um, really do trend uh, with uh, the national population, right? And that makes sense. Uh, whites are the, is, are the majority um, of the nation. Uh, usually in a national pop sample, they do constitute usually you know, close to 80% uh, of respondents, sometimes 90% of respondents. Uh, and so when we have national uh, poll figures, we do uh, tend to more or less reflect uh, the attitudes of white Americans. Uh, but we can see here with the um, kind of cobalt blue and then the lighter blue bar demonstrating blacks and Latinos, uh, uh, we can see here that immigration attitudes don't uh, trend uh, exactly along with whites. Um, in fact, Latinos, um, as you might possibly expect, are uh, much more um, open towards uh, immigration. Uh, they're less likely to say they want immigration decreased. Uh, blacks, uh, as well, uh, well, while they are closer to whites, right, they also demonstrate uh, a, a, a distinctive uh, pattern, um, slightly less, less likely to uh, want immigration decreased. Um, regardless of the measures that we ask about immigration, because immigration actually, you know, it can encompass, uh, I think, a lot of various different types of, of dimensions of social life. Uh, this one asks the question, should all immigrants who are in the United States be eligible for social services provided by the state government? Um, and so again, if we disaggregate the population by whites, blacks, Asian Americans, Latinos, we can see here that even on this indicator of providing social services to immigrants, uh, whites, blacks, Asian, Latino all, uh, have uh, very different attitudes uh, towards eligibility, right? Where, uh, interestingly, in this case, uh, Asian Americans are the most likely to support eligibility. Uh, Latinos next, uh, blacks a third, and then whites are the least likely. In fact, they, uh, they prefer that immigrants be ineligible uh, for state and local government uh, resources. Um, again, uh, if we change the measure, uh, we continue to see differences. Uh, this is, would you support or oppose a constitutional amendment to make English the nation's official language? Uh, so this is a much, this is a kind of switching from a more economic uh, kind of government intervention to a more cultural position, right, about kind of English being the, uh, the, the official language. Interestingly, right, uh, over half of all Americans do support English as official language. However, we can see that there are differences here. Um, interestingly here, uh, there's more of a divide here between whites and non-whites. Uh, than there is really, as we, we were seeing from the other slides, right, from um, uh, between whites, blacks, uh, blacks, I'm sorry, Asians and Latinos. Uh, so really kind of what I wanted to start off with looking at the data is really thinking about uh, really, you know, this uh, disaggregation, right, and, and considering uh, the fact that when we're thinking about American opinions, uh, that uh, it's important to think about um, not just uh, effectively kind of the white majority, but really uh, what uh, racial minorities are thinking about immigration. Um, now, kind of related to the way that we tend to present data, uh, political scientists have offered different theories about why Americans do tend to lean more anti-immigrant uh, than pro-immigrant. Uh, and so historically, in political science, the literature offers different comp tests of competing hypotheses. Uh, and the most often used hypotheses uh, are what they call an economic threat hypothesis, a cultural threat hypothesis, and then uh, a racial prejudice hypothesis, right? So with the economic threat hypothesis, the idea here is that 
why would Americans be um, anti-immigrant or relative more, an, more anti-immigrant than pro-immigrant is because they, they look at immigrants as a threat to uh, their livelihood or to jobs, right, uh, or a threat to the economy, right, so there are kind of more, more or less, um, you know, use of economic reasons for why immigration is threatening. Uh, the, uh, the second hypothesis that's often pitted uh, uh, in studies is this quality of cultural threat, right, so immigrants bring in um, different, uh, quote, non-American cultures, uh, right, and so they uh, pose a threat to the cultural fabric of the United States, uh, and that's why Im uh, Americans would be anti-immigrant. And then finally, this idea of racial prejudice, right, especially related to the assumption that uh, immigrants today are Latino, right, and so we would <coughs> expect that um, kind of being anti-Latino or having a, a racial prejudice against Latinos uh, is, is a driver, right, of, of anti-immigrant <coughs> attitudes. So political scientists tend to kind of you know, pit these two against, you know, two or three against each other. You know, which matters more? Is it their economic opinions? Uh, is it their cultural, um, you know, perceptions of threat? Is it racial prejudice, right? And so we get a lot of studies, particularly in the 80s and 90s, testing these these different theories. Um, and so, you know, really, what my co-author and I um, uh, critique about the literature uh, is that, you know, when you look at national pop samples. Um, which really are reflecting white attitudes. Uh, one of our concerns here is that these types of theories really best describe when you are a white American, right, this is uh, effectively kind of how you might be perceiving threat uh, from an, an outgroup member, uh, uh, specifically an immigrant group. Um, and so especially when we kind of uh, think about uh, kind of applicability, um, we think about really white Americans as our kind of, you know, kind of standard default American, and then we're thinking about kind of theories that explain their anti-immigrant uh, position. Um, what's consistent with this kind of uh, the, the uh, embedded assumption that we're really assuming white Americans as the American uh, respondent uh, is that oftentimes when uh, researchers pit against the cultural, economic, or racial prejudice hypotheses against each other, um, the racial hypothesis does tend to override the other two. Not to say that economic and cultural uh, threat doesn't explain immigrant attitudes, but if you add racial prejudice in the mix, right, um, that is uh, usually the more overwhelming um, explanatory mechanism. Uh, it's consistent, right, with kind of thinking about white Americans as the native-born respondent. They're looking at an outgroup member who is racially different from them, uh, likely Latino, right, and so this, this idea of racial prejudice being primed um, when uh, white Americans are thinking about immigration. So even you can think the results are also very consistent uh, with an embedded assumption uh, that Americans are white, Amer uh, that are white. Um, uh, and so uh, the problem, of course, is that uh, because these are the, the, the standing theories, uh, is that very little of the research really tries to investigate uh, really how uh, immigration attitudes might vary between racial minorities and whites. Um, and theoretically, how might we be able to develop a more generalizable or universal theory for explaining anti-immigrant attitudes that really incorporates uh, the black, Asian American, or Latino experience. Um, the other thing that we were concerned about is that, in general, one of the other things that social scientists tend to do is they tend to do studies on white Americans and then kind of make the assumption that the findings that you find for white Americans really apply to whites, blacks, Asian, and, and, and Latinos. So this is what I mean by kind of assuming that the mechanisms also explain the same uh, across groups. So, uh, you know, so for example, if you assume that economic threat you know, kind of predict, you know, increases uh, anti-immigrant attitudes by 50% uh, for whites, you assume that it also increases anti-immigrant attitudes for blacks by 50%, by Latinos for 50%, and then by Asian Americans by 50%, right? There's no kind of assumption, one, that the effect might actually vary, right? That it might be really high for whites, but it might be low for other groups. There's also not even a concern uh, that perhaps the directionality might be different, right? That while economic opinions may be uh, positively related to anti-immigrant opinions for, for white Americans, they might be negatively uh, related, negatively um, or indirectly related uh, for, say, Asian Americans, right, or Latinos, right. So even kind of the relationship between the two might vary uh, across uh, racial groups. And again, because we don't study this, we actually don't necessarily know um, what these effects actually might be. 
so what we do, and there's, there's kind of multiple um, uh, objectives in this book, but one of the objectives, of course, is for us to identify uh, or offer uh, readers a theory uh, that could better explain immigration attitudes that incorporates uh, a diverse America. Um, and the theory that we offer is uh, really, uh, rather than thinking about these ideas of threat, uh, instead thinking about uh, the mechanism of group identity um, as a more appropriate way to understand anti-immigrant attitudes. Uh, and psychologists uh, actually talk a lot about in group, uh, uh, group identities because this uh, kind of concept of uh, individuals having an in-group, right, and that you feeling much more closer to those that you identify as part of your own group, uh, and then you're less likely to have positive uh, attitudes towards people who are not in your in your in your in group that you, they usually label the out group. So there's kind of long-standing psychological theories about kind of thinking about who you think is part of your own um, uh, uh, kind of, uh, members members in your own group versus who is not, right? And that really is a very baseline uh, type of process that goes on uh, in human psychology. Um, and so we thought that really this kind of idea of in-groups versus out-groups is a more appropriate way of theorizing about immigration attitudes. Um, but of course that means we need to think about how the group is created, right? So how are people conceptualizing group boundaries? Um, and the two that we think uh, exist um, in interaction when it comes to thinking about uh, attitudes towards immigrants um, are two types of identities. One. Of course, since we're thinking about new members to America, the first group identity is your national identity, right? So kind of how you think about being a member of the United States, and then of course, you know, how you would react to someone new entering the United States. Um, the other one uh, that we argue, the other type of identity, identity we argue is really important when we think about immigration um, is someone's racial identity. Um, uh, we think about this for multiple reasons. Uh, one, I think as a, a, a historic, um, identity uh, that has had a lot of political resonance. Political resonance uh, is race, right? Kind of the race does influence things like partisanship. Uh, it influences things like uh, you know various different positions on social policy. Uh, it is very consistent in its effects on many kind of public opinion. So one in general, uh, race is uh, an important mechanism for us in political science. Uh, but also too, because we're thinking about immigration. And a lot of uh, various different scholars on immigration really have come to a general scholarly understanding uh, that immigration really has been uh, a tool used by the federal government to control uh, the racial diversity in the United States, right? And so race inherently is, race ethnicity is inherently um, uh, uh, an important dimension, right, when we think about immigration policy, right, because we're thinking about uh, the makeup of the United States, specifically the racial and ethnic makeup. So we argue here that this priming of racial identity, kind of who, how you think about your own racial group, right, um, and how you think about other racial groups is also important, an important group identity to think about. Um, and so our argument here uh, then is that um, group identity is really the central mechanism for understanding uh, anti-immigrant or pro-immigrant attitudes. Uh, but also more important here is that um, it's a central mechanism because racial groups, uh, we argue, uh, really do vary in their attachment to the nation and to their racial group. And so this variation in how these groups think about their different groupness, as we, uh, you know, is helps. Hi there. As we um, saw in the immigration figures that I just that I showed, right, help better explain the variation because it's not necessarily just whites and racial minorities have different attitudes, but it is actually whites, blacks, Asians, Arabs, Latinos, all have, each have different patterns of attitudes, right? And so this idea kind of of the, of the uh, different levels of attachment for groups helps also explain even that uh, more diverse variation uh, than what we see. Um, so, uh, you know, I think the, the first thing that I wanted to do uh, for this presentation before we kind of look at the results uh, is really offer some historical um, justification um, and development for uh, the relationship between someone's national identity and immigration uh, and their racial identity and immigration. Uh, and we uh, really point to, when we think about national identity, uh, is thinking about uh, the different ways in which these racial groups have experienced their citizenship um, or perceptions of belonging in the United States over time. Um, and uh, this, I think, will help 
really kind of understand some of the data about why, uh, in terms of our national identity, whites, blacks, Asian Americans, and Latinos have different senses of national identity. Um, you know, I think the first off is that uh, the way that we understand the creation of citizenship in the United States is that a white, uh, the white racial category really has been the privileged category in the United States that has defined uh, really what, it's, what has been, uh, what it means to be American, right? So there's kind of, there is a, there is a, a symbolic relationship be between whiteness uh, and Americanness. Um, and that was established through various different historical um, uh, experiences and decisions uh, that made non-white individuals less than full citizens of the United States, right? Uh, which meant that those who were classified as non-white had really different types of relationships between the na with the nation uh, and different feelings of belonging um, uh, in their nation. Uh, and so we cover, you know, various different types of processes that are experienced by African Americans, Latinos, and Asian Americans. Um, I just kind of summarize some of them here. You know, for African Americans, right, we uh, can look really at the founding, uh, and uh, most of the uh, antebellum era in the United States, uh, where blacks were uh, constructed uh, legally as not uh, equal citizens. In fact, Dred Scott v. Stanford actually. Uh, decided that blacks were actually property, not actual uh, individuals that could sue for their citizenship and their freedom, right? And so establish, establishing here for African Americans that their citizenship was less than whites, right? And that the United States would protect whites, uh, white privileges, uh, before they would protect uh, black uh, civil liberties and civil rights. Um, for Asian Americans, uh, they've been most influenced uh, particularly by naturalization law, uh, the 1790 naturalization law, which was the first naturalization law passed by Congress um, to decide how to integrate new members in the United States, uh, dictated that there was a prerequisite uh, that you would be a free white male uh, as eligible for naturalization in the United States. And so this prerequisite of whiteness, right, is effectively has been used um, really through 1952 to exclude Asian American um, Asian uh, immigrants from becoming uh, citizens of the United States. Uh, and so Asian, Asian, uh, Asian American communities have really established in the United States for a very long time. Uh, their, 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 their actual official denial of citizenship, which of course then um, mediated right, their ability to uh, buy property, right, to have various different types of uh, equality in jobs, serve on juries, etc., uh, since they weren't citizens. citizens. Right, so this kind of idea of you know the classic forever foreigner that oftentimes um, uh, is a stereotype that applies to Asian Americans really does have its roots in legal theory. Um, and then finally, for our Latinos, right, their experience uh, has been very different from Blacks and from for Asian Americans because in many ways we talk about the kind of unique aspect of Latinos being integrated in the United States real, really through conquest or, or colonialization, right? So effectively the uh, annexation of the United States uh, with areas uh, of Mexico, and then, of course, the acquisition of Puerto Rico through this, the war with Spain creates a, uh, this, is this much more colonial relationship between Latinos and the United States, right? Again, uh, uh, really offering a framework for Latinos to understand uh, their uh, lack of privileges um, as full members in the, uh, in the United States, particularly as compared to whites. Right, and so, um, so kind of I think historically we can adopt uh, various different trajectories of how uh, different uh, racial minority groups have thought about their membership in the United States. Um, one of the things that I we thought was uh, uh, just you know um, when when the, uh, when the Obamas in, in office, there were so many examples uh, that just made it easy for us to really kind of think about the tension between someone's national identity, um, that racial, the tension that racial minorities feel with their national identity, um, uh, really characterized by various different incidents involving uh, attacks against the Obamas. This one we thought was a really great, a really kind of a perfect example of what we were talking about, which is this kind of tension uh, that racial minorities feel, right, with their sense of full membership uh, in the United States. And, and this was uh, in the uh, 2008 campaign when Obama first ran for president, uh, there was a whole de the debacle because um, uh, Michelle Obama had made a speech in which she said, quote, for the first time in my adult life, I'm really proud of my country because it feels like hope is making a comeback. 
not just because Barack has done well, because, but because I think people are hungry for change, right? So she was trying to make this really inspiring um, uh, speech, right, to supporters. Um, and uh, she made this comment about, I'm, I'm finally, effectively uh, proud of my country, right? And so uh, what happened, however, is that uh, there were different segments of the population that really, that really honed in on this idea that she wasn't always proud of her country, right? And so it became uh, a, a, a very um, uh, contentious issue in the campaign that the Obamas weren't really proud to be American. Right, that they really were only proud in certain instances, right, where shouldn't they, but if they're going to be the first lady and, and the president of the United States, right, shouldn't they always be proud uh, and feel really solidly American, right? But I think a lot of us, uh, you know, who study um, minority identities, right, and minority communities, you know, we think about that that made a lot of sense to us, right, that, you know, this was an instance here where the United States was really upholding its norm of equality, right? And so I think a lot of uh, minority communities heard what she was trying to say, right? And could intuitively kind of understand, right, this, this idea of kind of why in some instances you wouldn't always be so loyal to the, and proud of your country, but in other instances you, you felt um, a, a really strong sense of national identity. Uh, of course, what happens is that the uh, McCains, uh, who the, you know, John McCain was uh, running as the Republican candidate, of course, comes out and says, "Well, we're always proud of our country, right?" And so this is this is uh, uh, again, uh, there was a, also a very implicit racialization in this, right? Because for white Americans, right, they were really trying to communicate to uh, voters, right, that you know they always have a sense, you know, that America is great, right, that America will take care of them, and that they should always be proud. And there's this very you know kind of unyielding sense uh, of a national identity that always kind of um, that never wanes. Uh, regardless uh, of an instance uh, that happens, right, or experience that happens. Um, and so looking at the data, uh, I think that the historical narrative of citizenship in the United States and even these examples that we see in everyday current events uh, helps explain some of the levels, uh, varying levels of attachment that racial groups have uh, to the nation. So this was an interesting question uh, posed uh, on one survey um, which was, they asked, uh, which identity uh, would you say is more important to you? And they asked, is it American, is it your American identity, or is it your racial identity, or both, right? And so, um, what was interesting about this is once you disaggregate by race of respondent, white Americans are overwhelmingly uh, uh, going to set, they overwhelmingly said that their American identity, their national identity, is the most important to them, right? A, a small share uh, uh, said that it was race, uh, less than a third, um, and, and uh, very few said equally, right? In contrast, if you look at racial minorities, right, that the um, idea of both their race and their American identity being meaningful for them uh, was the most common answer, uh, and the overwhelming majority of actually all three groups uh, really kind of thinking about both of these identities being very important, right? So they weren't putting one identity over the other, interestingly, in contrast to white Americans who really prioritize their white identity. Um, uh, they saw the importance of, 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 of both of them. Uh, and so, um, you know, so, you know, can we start thinking, of course, first of, uh, about um, national identity. The other identity that uh, of course, uh, we had to offer some uh, theoretical uh, scaffolding for is thinking about uh, racial identity, ra uh, racial group formation, right? And so, um, again, um, racial group formation uh, in many ways uh, uh, is somewhat consistent across groups. Uh, we kind of think about various different psychological theories, um, you know, this kind of idea of in-groups versus out-groups. Right, uh, you would feel more closer, uh, kind of be more in common with people of your same racial group. Uh, that's pretty consistent, regardless of what racial group we're talking about. Uh, whites, blacks, Asian Americans, and Latinos all generally think similarly uh, about closeness to the racial group. Uh, there is some light variation. Uh, this is an example of, of what political scientists, um, uh, one way political scientists measure a group identity, racial group identity, which is what we call the link fate measure. Uh, which is the question, um, do you think what happens to your racial group impacts what happens to you in your own life? So kind of linking your individual life chances to the group. 
Um, and so we can see here in general um, uh, there is uh, uh, there is variation um, for African Americans. Uh, there is they're the highest likely to say a lot. Uh, they have high levels of length fate. Um, but large proportions actually of each group say at least some. Uh, so that's making up the, at least the majority. Interestingly, in this in this survey, uh, which is not necessarily consistent with some of the other uh, findings on Latinos, Latinos uh, demonstrate somewhat light uh, or a low, not light, low. Uh, racial group identity, 53% uh, saying not at all. Uh, that's not as consistent with uh, some of the other uh, uh, surveys. Um, Latinos uh, are, are look a little bit more like Asian Americans in their response to link fate on the whole. So this one is a little bit off, but I like to use this one because it was uh, one that actually was had the same um, e equitable numbers of whites, blacks, Asian Americans, Latinos in the survey, so it allowed me to kind of do um, a little bit of an easier comparison in one shot. Yeah. Good. I know you're getting into the, uh, into the data. Of, yeah. Uh, I'm getting into these stats, right? but uh, but in the data you're about to present, were respondents asked uh, specifically how they felt about immigration from Europe, Asia, Latin America, or Africa? Uh, it seems that the, the true. The, I mean, were, were they asked that question? Um, they, they we didn't ask that specific question. We were, we did some other studies that used visual primes, so they were looking at pictures of immigrants, and so we did vary the race of immigrants. Um, um, and, you know, so they were asked a question and they were kind of had a picture underneath to kind of kind of implicitly offer them a sense of the type of immigrant that was coming in, uh, and that did make a difference. Um, if I have time, I, I have that data, so we can kind of look at that. Um, Gallup, however, does ask, they've asked that since the 2000s, um, about uh, immigrants coming from different countries. And as you would expect, um, uh, right, white Americans really have the highest preference for immigrants coming in from um, Europe, right, the lowest level of preference uh, from Latin America. Um, uh, and uh, that's not consistent with some of the Latino and, and African American data from Gallup. So yeah, you are correct that we actually asked about specific types of immigrants. The attitudes do change. Yeah, that is correct. Um, um, okay, so, so in terms of uh, racial identity, one, we see uh, some variation, but two, what's the, what's the most uh, kind of distinctive, uh, I think, important, uh, distinctive difference that's the most important here for us to uh, think about group identity is kind of the, the degree to which it's really what we call considered kind of politicized, or to the degree to which it really con communicates the sense of, of um, uh, kind of race uh, difference, uh, or oftentimes exclusion from the United uh, from uh, from uh, society, right? Um, and so this is a, a figure here that we use the same uh, measures that the link fate measure. And so basically, I, I separated them into those respondents who had low link fate, so either they said not at all or or not very much, right? That's the the, the light gray bar, and then the dark gray bar are those that said um, right or a lot or some. And I compare that to um, the percent of, of those respondents that perceived that there was a lot of discrimination against their own racial group, right? To see the relationship between if you have a high sense of group identity, right, kind of what is your, what is your perspective about how groups experience discrimination uh, in the United States. Uh, and we can see here that for racial minorities, having a high sense of group, those with high sense of group identity, uh, were much more likely on average to say that their racial group experiences racial discrimination uh, in the country, right? And so we can see here the, uh, the larger uh, dark gray bars here compared to those with low link fate. Um, but for whites, uh, one, um, one, of course, I think the perception that their, their group experiences discrimination, of course, is low, uh, but also very, uh, a very minimal difference between if they have a high group identity versus a low group identity, right? So kind of uh, we use this data to, to help kind of supplement uh, what this racial identity really means, right? So even though all racial groups in general do feel close to their racial group, we argue, right, that the racial identity substantively has different meaning for racial minorities than it does uh, compared, compared to whites, right? So, so again, I think we think there's an important kind of variation across groups here. Okay, so this uh, kind of leads us then to kind of thinking about uh, hypotheses and, and the relationships we could we should expect between when you include 
um, measures of uh, American identity uh, versus uh, racial identity in predictors as predictors of anti-immigrant attitudes. Um, and so uh, what all of these figures show in general um, is that uh, for whites, uh, their racial identity and in many ways their national identity um, uh, don't conflict in terms of, because I, I understand that we were kind of looking at that where they do prefer their national identity, but in terms of uh, you know, kind of feeling close to uh, their, their kind of white racial group uh, doesn't necessarily seem to uh, have uh, a lot of conflict with, with also right, um, feeling very close to the national uh, their national identity, right, or having a strong national identity. Effectively, right, this is kind of related to uh, the, uh, this kind of uh, foundation, right, that the nation state really has this kind of prerequisite of whiteness, right, and that uh, effectively um, white Americans don't see a lot of conflict, right, um, or, or kind of you know, uh, explicit conflict with um, being white and feeling American, right, at the, at the, at the same time. But they actually don't kind of uh, actually perceive them. In fact, they, they prefer their national identity over their racial identity. Um, for racial identities, how, uh, uh, racial minorities, however, um, their ra be being a racial minority does uh, exist in tension um, with their um, sense of national belonging, right? So uh, we argue then that we should expect that there should be tension between their racial, uh, someone's strong racial identity and a strong uh, national identity which of course then would mean that we would expect different relationships with immigration attitudes, right? So our expectations on the bottom here uh, would be for whites, um, uh, having a strong white identity and, and a strong national identity would predict anti-immigrant attitudes, right? Because for white Americans, both immigrants would be a racial outgroup, um, right? And uh, they're also not American, right? So we would expect strong identities on both to predict uh, whites being anti-immigrant. Uh, for minorities as well, when they think of themselves as American, they're looking at newcomers and, they're, and they would argue that um, uh, they might be hesitant about uh, incorporating new Americans into the United States. However, uh, their racial identity might not necessarily predict anti-immigrant attitudes. In fact, as we were talking about discrimination, right, that uh, high racial identity really uh, makes uh, racial minorities think about uh, inequities, uh, in the United States, right, that uh, there are uh, various different processes of discrimination, uh, and so that uh, percep those perceptions actually likely mediate um, their response to uh, immigrants, and actually uh, might actually make them more inclusive as they're th as they're seeing various different discriminatory actions uh, against uh, immigrants um, uh, in uh, various different instances in society. Uh, so uh, this is uh, some kind of classic political science analysis, which is that we use kind of multivariate regression. Um, in this case, the dependent variable is uh, anti-immigrant attitudes. So effectively, we're trying to explain anti-immigrant attitudes. Um, and then for us, uh, we wanted to use uh, various different types of explanatory variables. Uh, so our independent variables are both kind of what scholars have argued uh, explain anti-immigrant attitudes, so for example, uh, you know, their economic threat, right, so we include uh, economic outlook. Um, we also include uh, things like contact with immigrants, right, so different types of, of controls there that uh, others have argued um, would affect your anti-immigrant attitudes. But we added our key variables that we argue are more important, which is uh, linked fate or group identity um, and uh, a measure for national identity. So we argue here that these two, our two variables, are going to have more of an impact um, uh, or, or a very strong impact on immigrant attitudes relative to these others. Um, just real quickly, you already saw the link fate, uh, the date on the link fate measure. So um, the way that we measured link fate was uh, the question, how strongly do you agree or disagree uh, with the statement, uh, as things get better for your own group, your own racial group in general, things get better for me, right? So. Uh, that's a version of, of a racial group identity measure. Um, and then for us, we used um, a American identity measure uh, that asked Americans, or the respondents, to define what they think is being true American. So kind of, this is why we call it American boundary. So to the degree to which uh, a respondent thought that there were very clear um, uh, dimensions or, or uh, demographics to being an American. Uh, and so people who thought um, that all five of those characteristics 
have effectively for us a strong American value. So effectively they kind of see a very clear sense of who American is and who is not. Those with a low American boundary effectively say no, right, to all five of those characteristics um, as what it means to be American, right? So we're trying to kind of get a sense of how people draw their boundaries um, for the nation. So uh, this is a, a, a regression model here. Um, and uh, we're just highlighting the two variables of interest here, which are, is our link fate variable and our American boundary uh, variable. Um, uh, I have the full model here, but uh, that's not as much of an interest for us today. Um, effectively, all what we're looking for when we're looking at regression models, uh, you, don't, you don't really need to know these, all of these um, uh, very detailed specifics here. But effectively, we're looking at the directionality um, of the coefficient, so whether or not these numbers are positive or negative to tell us whether or not uh, the, that variable is directly related to anti-immigrant attitudes uh, or if it's indirectly related to immigrant attitudes, right? And so we can see here that for whites, both their racial identity and their American battery are positive, right? So effectively, whites with high racial identity um, and who have very strong sense of American boundaries, they are more likely to prefer immigration to, to decrease. Uh, in contrast, we see that for blacks, Asian Americans, and Latinos, uh, the, um, the effect is reverse for their, for their racial identity. Um, it is negative uh, for linked fate on, for all three of the groups, uh, but it's positive um, on their national identity. So very consistent uh, what, we, which, what we were expecting, uh, which is that their racial identity made um, racial minorities more inclusive, feeling more inclusive. Uh, whereas strong national identities made them feel um, more anti-immigrant. Um, kind of, uh, since regression models oftentimes don't give us uh, enough of a picture, uh, these are some um, simulations here. So uh, what this is are kind of simulated uh, people kind of in what they would um, look like in terms of their immigration attitudes if they had those kind of characteristics. Um, so these are people who have a strong American boundaries, so those that answered yes to all five of those characteristics, right? Um, and then uh, we disaggregated and looked at Latinos, Asian Americans, Blacks, and Whites with high racial identity versus low racial identity. Um, and you can see here that for whites, um, those with high racial identity, right, they are much more likely to say that um, immigration should be reduced by a lot compared to those with low racial identity, right? So we can see then there's this, in many ways, um, this kind of additive or interactive effect where kind of it's both strong identities uh, on both race and nation increase uh, their uh, anti-immigrant attitudes. However, right, for blacks, Asian Americans, Latinos, uh, we see the reverse effect, which is that really when they have low racial identity, right, so they have low racial group attachment, um, but they have strong sense of national identity, those are the folks uh, that are more likely uh, to be anti-immigrant, right, than, than uh, minorities with strong racial identities. Um, and then we see the same thing here, uh, a very similar kind of effect with uh, respondents who perceive weak American boundaries. So these are the folks that said no to all five uh, of those characteristics. Um, and again, comparing uh, low versus high racial identity, we can see here that for racial minorities, when they see, have a low national identity and a low uh, racial identity, they're much more likely right, to, um, uh, to, to feel anti-immigrant. Um, and uh, uh, for whites, right, we see, we see the reverse. So we can kind of see here uh, this, um, this kind of interaction here between uh, thinking about race and, and thinking, about, um, uh, thinking about the nation. Um, so uh, this was kind of really what I had planned to talk about today, and I know um, Ben has some uh, uh, other questions that I would be happy to talk about, but I did want to kind of close um, thinking about the 2016 election uh, because um, what I thought was really interesting was that off, you know, what was very well publicized was how explicitly racialized uh, Trump talked about um, uh, immigration, Right and how we should how we should treat uh, new members of society, uh, and so that was really a key part of the narrative, right? About kind of this explicit racial language, you know, kind of talking about Mexicans being rapists, right? And this is why we shouldn't want uh, uh, these these types of individuals in the United States as as a as a as a way of talking about immigration policy. Um, 
But what I thought was actually also interesting that, that uh, was a uh, uh, little less talked about, but I think is really consistent with um, our theory about really needing to be paying attention to racial identity being primed, but also national identity being primed, was how well Trump was able to kind of both explicitly talk about uh, race, but also he was very much priming uh, national identity um, uh, in many ways very visually uh, throughout most of his campaign. In a lot of his uh, pr uh, public appearances, this is a common, this uh, lining up of the American flags was a real common setup for his public appearances. Uh, he did this at Trump Tower when he made his kind of original announcements. Uh, this is the convention on the top corner. Uh, he continues to do it as president. Like this is when he was talking about um, uh, his, his, his taxes. He continues to do it as president, where he stands in front of these multiple lined up kind of American flags. Uh, and I think that this is really kind of a ripe area for us to kind of think about really uh, the uh, true effectiveness of what Trump was doing in the 2016 election, because he was really uh, kind of equitably priming both this kind of, you know, uh, kind of a white, strong white identity, or, you know, or effectively kind of anti-minority identity, um, and he was also really uh, visually um, priming a, a strong national sense of membership, right, or, or national identity um, uh, through his various visuals uh, with American flags. And so I, I was kind of thinking that, you know, really the kind of double message that white Americans were getting from him uh, over the course of the 2016 election uh, possibly is really what made uh, his narrative so enticing, I think, for uh, a good swath of white Americans. Because I think it was really interesting. A lot of white Americans were like, ah, eh, yeah, he's saying these racist things, but you know, like we don't actually necessarily, you know, kind of believe that he's really going to do it, right? But you know, it, but but also subconsciously, right? They're 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 also being uh, primed with this national identity, right? So they're kind of thinking that they're not really being racist. Uh, you know, by um, supporting him, right? But at the same time, he's priming a different sense of identity, which we also know um, predicts uh, anti-immigrant attitudes. So um, I thought I would, you know, kind of close in, in thinking about um, really kind of applications here uh, for uh, our, our more recent period um, and uh, trying to explain some of the outcomes for 2016. So, so, so I'll, I'll end there um, and uh, we'll be happy to Answer questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, can you tell me more about why you uh, simulated the data? I mean, just uh, I mean, usually uh, I uh, uh, try to do it just to kind of give uh, a little bit of extra detail about the differences across. Because you know, I think that yeah, of, of differences well across the measure, yeah. right? So it gives us a better variation of uh, the relationship between two of the independent variables in the model, right? Uh, rather than the regression model, really just know it gives you the isolated effect when you control for everything else. So political science. This is a political science thing. That they so if I was in front of political science audience, they would expect the simulation. So I do it also out of partially out of training, uh, but they like to kind of see, right, when you kind of uh, take a person and you kind of think about their different characteristics, if you kind of think about the interaction effects of kind of their So, so you can see the effect of the things that you hold constant. Right, okay. right, 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 yeah. I'm yes. not a political scientist, so I need to clarify, have this clarify. What do you mean by simulating the data? Is that she, she motivating that the she, data? She said, maybe she should answer this. Yeah, so, so she was asking about, um, uh, this 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 finding here is, is is the standard effect, you know. So it's a it's a it's a regression model. So effectively, what this is saying is that when you hold everything okay. else constant, right? So for us, you you know you assume someone is the same age, the the same education level, all Democrats, etc. Right? What's the unique effect of, of your racial identity on immigrant attitudes? Uh, and so each of these numbers is really giving you just the just the isolated of link fader of American values. So then these are what we call simulations, which is the kind of idea of uh, thinking about 
not just what's the isolated effect of your racial identity, but also because we were interested in the relationship between your American identity and your race identity. And so if someone varied, if they were kind of high race identity, what's the relationship then? Um, uh, or what's the kind of um, interactive effect then with their uh, national identity, and then how does that predict American attitude? So we're trying to kind of mathematically um, offer this kind of simulation of kind of, you know, if, if we could control you for everything, right. but then only vary your race, racial identity, and only vary your, your American identity, what would you look like in terms of your immigration attitudes? Yeah. So mine is going to be less complicated. Yes. <laughs> the, uh, the first slide that you did showed a dramatic increase of African Americans' attitudes around 2001, between 2001 and 2002. Mm -hmm. Do you know what attributed to that? 9-11. Maybe, but nobody else has jumped like that. I mean, it was really. But so there was an increase for white. I think everyone increased, but but you're saying that it was a, it was a it was a more it was a a, a, a stronger effect for for blacks. Yeah, Latinos are not pretty. Um, but they were already low. They yeah. So I mean I think uh, in general uh, I think the important thing is to show that you know really uh, for all groups they are they we're getting the we are it's likely a 9/11 bomb. Um, the the thing about um, you know kind of um, making kind of too much of something is is to remember that you know these are uh, not the same blacks, right? So it's just a every time we collect a new year, you you talk to another you know, uh, 800 blacks, right? And so sometimes when you see differences, we, we, we uh, uh, caution people to not overly interpret them because you're also talking to a, a, an entirely different set uh, of black, black Americans. And so, you know, the set that was talking to 2001 versus 2002 are different people. Uh, and so on the aggregate, it did go up, right? But, uh, you know, uh, I wouldn't, I, I also tend not to make a, uh, a, a ginormous uh, kind of um, conclusion, um, you know, when there's uh, some subtle, some of the subtle differences that you, know, that you see there. Yes, yes. No, my, my, that was, I was going to go there too. Because yeah. There is a pattern here of, see, and even while there are differences, there seems to be an ebb and flow, that, especially when after 2002, between blacks and whites that are pretty close. And what's also significant is the drop especially among whites while Latinos are plateauing from 2005 to 2006. Mm -hmm. And my thought was, well, first there was a question, why was that happening among whites in particular? But then 2006 is these massive pro-immigrant right, rallies, right, 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 right. which I imagine having to, explaining the big divergence. Right. Because even while Latinos didn't drop much, it dropped somewhat. Right, right, right. Whereas whites and blacks went way up again. Um, I can't remember when, what month they collect this data, um, because it might actually be the, the case that for 2006, that so the protests were May and June of 2006, um, and so it may be that the 2007 data is actually capturing the immigrant protests better than the 2000, because they could have been asked in January of 2006, but the protests haven't happened yet, um, right, so we're not going to expect the the, the the bump uh, there. 2006, uh, interestingly, was was when um, uh, George W. Bush was really pushing his agenda for um, immigration reform. So uh, we did. I think we were seeing a little bit of a. We were seeing some change with uh, white Republicans, as Republicans were making attempts to, you know, kind of come to some agreement. Uh, you know, Bush ran as a compassionate conservative, right? So he was really trying to, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, there were other reasons for why he wanted to be a compassionate conservative, but um, you know, he, you know, if we kind of, you know, kind of go back to Bush, uh, it's, it's hard to believe. You know, I, I, I saw the joke. Um, there was a joke by Aziz Ansari. He was, he was talking about how, you know, he he he, um, he feels guilty that he has such nostalgia for Bush now that he's in you know he's in the Trump era. You know, <laughs> it's like it's like we all have we all we all these like nostalgias for for George W. Bush, and this is going to be one of them, right? So like George W. Bush, right, was really trying to promote like you know a comprehensive, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of you know uh, less racist you know kind of a approach to approach to immigration, um, and uh, he he was I think. 
in some ways influencing uh, white Republicans. I mean, I don't know how much, but I think that could also explain I'm some of that. I'm wondering, too, whether or not the drop from prior to that might be, you know, return to kind of normal. Oh, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I've, I've never uh, kind of uh, run um, kind of individual models for each year, because usually just more uses for demonstrating the uh, kind of differences across race. Uh, but that would make sense, too. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I wonder if you could uh, share a little bit. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about shared faith. Um, yeah. Shared faith. Share faith. Um, uh, I, I think shared faith makes a lot more sense when you're talking about African Americans. And I think Michael Dawson's work has really shown very nicely, mm -hmm. you know, how African Americans across class regions and so on right. really feel like a very strong sense of shared faith. Right. And there's a lot of good reasons for that. Uh, but uh, but I, I, I think when you talk about shared faith for Latinos, and, and I'm not sure how to think about this for Asians, maybe you can help me there. Yeah. But uh, when it comes to Latinos and shared faith, but there's just a lot of noise in this data deck. True. Uh, and uh, when Latinos think about how their faith is uh, is linked to that of other Latinos, uh, it's, uh, it, it's 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 going to be complicated by uh, by race, by phenotype, for example. And and for Latinos, it runs a, a huge gamut mm -hmm. from being you know, white uh, to being very dark and indigenous. Um, you know, class also uh, will uh, will modify this as well. And I tell you, I, I, uh, I think a lot about you know the clothes I'm wearing, you know the car I'm driving. Mm -hmm. You know, if all of this goes into my thinking, you know, am I, am I okay mm -hmm. in this situation in this neighborhood and so on? Uh, uh, class makes a difference, right? Uh, because some, some people are just never okay because uh, because they're just too poor uh, uh, to to purchase a purchase a bundle of things. Uh, and then uh, and then there's culture. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, if you're more acculturated. Uh, if you speak English well, if you speak it without an accent, mm -hmm. uh, then you know I get that that's another way of uh, not only navigating the cultural terrain in the United States, but also distinguishing yourself from others who don't have those those, those cultural cultural tools. I think there's just a lot that can be going on mm -hmm. when you ask Latinos, you know, is your faith linked to that uh, of uh, you know, Sorry for being so long-winded, but I wanted you to. Uh, no, just, yeah, just no, yeah. I, I see that. Uh, did you did you want to uh, add, did you want to add on to, to that? I just thought about how there's another kind of twist to the shared faith mm -hmm. and national identity issue. It could very well be that for the really weird, frustrating cases where you encounter these anecdotally, you'll meet a Latino or Latino who is anti-immigrant. You'll meet an Asian who is anti-immigrant. You'll meet some person of color who expresses anti-immigrant sensibilities or opinions. My three and, brothers. Yeah. <laughs> well, here is where linked faith works in a perverse way because perhaps for that person of color, the Asian, the Latino, they are thinking, uh, I'm not that guy, I am not that illegal, but that illegal is gonna make it worse for me. Mm -hmm. And the illegal is gonna make it worse for others who are like Asians, like Latinos, and so forth, whom they are linking fate in that kind of weird, perverse way, mm -hmm. or at least perverse in terms right. of our uh, discussion today. Right, 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 yeah, I think these are great, I mean, so uh, I think, you know, uh, both of these, um, uh, 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 suggestions here um, really do speak to one another. Uh, you know, when uh, political scientists at least think about uh, group identity, um, I would I don't think that actually this is as much adopted by uh, psychologists because they're not necessarily as interested in the political effects of of, of their measures. Um, but for political scientists, uh, we make a, diff a distinction between having uh, a strong sense of group identity and a strong sense of what we consider a group consciousness. So there, which we, which we think dimensionality, they're, they're, they actually exist as, as, as uh, they, look, might, they look the same, right, but they actually have uh, um, a very unique uh, dimensions to them. Uh, group identity is really the idea that you, know, you, do, see a, you do see others of your, of your same group, you, know, you feel a sense of commonality, 
Uh, you think they have the same culture, right? So you do feel a strong sense uh, of those people sharing your, your group. Um, uh, and it may uh, uh, help in, in social situations, and that, et cetera. Um, group consciousness, however, uh, is a sense that you have group identity, right? But there are consequences to uh, holding that identity, right? And specifically, uh, it uh, is attached to kind of you know, the importance of having that identity as a way of combating various different types of, of, of discrimination. Um, and so uh, a lot of the theories argue, which is why we use a link fate measure, uh, is that link fate is much more of a measure of uh, kind of consciousness, right? So this idea uh, that your individual fate is linked with others, right, is this kind of idea that there are really these consequences to holding identity, which is different than just like I feel the same as other Japanese Americans because I have the same culture and I, you know. Uh, and so people with hot, strong, high group identities would probably actually react in some ways, I think, that the way that you argue, which is that they could have a strong identity as Chinese American or Mexican American or something, right? But um, it's not necessarily a consciousness, right? They, they uh, are not necessarily kind of making connections with their identity, between their identity and some of these other uh, types of phenomenon. Um, I mean, that's, that's kind of, that's, that's, that, that's, that's kind of part of the theory. Um, and so, uh, you know, to kind of go into Ben's question, which is, you know, that's why we see um, uh, a lot more variation on things like shared fate or any kind of other measure of group consciousness for Latinos and Asian Americans. Blacks generally uh, rate very high on a consciousness, any kind of consciousness measure. Uh, they rate high on a group identity measure. They also rate high on a consciousness measure. Um, Asian Americans and Latinos rate high on a group identity measures but they have much more variation on consciousness, uh, consciousness me measures, like the link fate, right? So that's why we saw, like, on Latinos, some measures say Latinos is 53% no, others say that, you know, Latinos are 53% yes. You know, they, they just vary depending on the Latinos that you're talking to. Um, but of the Latinos or Asian Americans that have a high, high sense of consciousness, they have a, it's, it's, very, it's, it's a really strong sense of racialization. And so we tend to see when we put them in models that uh, even though they're small in number, the effect for them we're seeing is, is really, it's, a, it's, it's not only a sense of, of, of seeing a commonality with the group, but really seeing uh, their group as being racial, racialized, right? And so then really that kind of having that, that additive um, information, or I guess that kind of additive uh, meaning for why you would feel attached to your racial group, right? Because you understand this kind of sense of racialization and then it has impacts on your attitudes about immigration. Uh, it has actually impacts on uh, other research has shown that group consciousness has had an impact on um, supporting Latino causes or Asian American causes. Um, uh, and actually, in, in some ways, some other various different other racialized uh, types of policies. So uh, I think, I bet I would agree with you, that is why for Asian Americans and Latinos we see so many more no's because it is such a difficult kind of phenomenon to uh, expect, right? But I think that there, what we show is that there is a, a proportion of Asian Americans and Latinos that really see, even though it's a pan-ethnic group, and you might have different culture, you might be immigrant or non-immigrant, that in some ways, you know, when a white American looks at a Latino, they're probably gonna treat that Latino the same, the same as you, regardless of whether they're Cuban, you know, <laughs> or, or immigrant or non-immigrant, right? The same thing goes for Asian Americans that we see this phenomenon where Asian Americans will say, well, you know, um, and, I, and I've had this in qualitative research, they'll, they'll say, well, you know, this person's getting treated, you know, they're Chinese and they're getting treated as this kind of foreign person, but then they look at me and they think, that I'm, all, I'm also Chinese, right? And so this is, you know, kind of ideally what we're trying to get at with the, a shared fate measure, which is, uh, you know, kind of this, this additive racialization. Uh, it's, that's, that's the theory, I mean, I think, to what extent we're actually measuring something like that. The possibility is, is also the, always the challenge. I, I to, might have just missed this, but well, thank you very much for a very interesting presentation. Oh, thank you. I might have just missed this, but I wonder if you, um, in your independent variables, was length of residency one of them? Um, I think it, we had the time in the United States. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Is there a way we could distinguish between immigrants and non immigrants, or is that part of the control? Yeah, so, it, so, so for us, when, you, when we control for length of time in the United States, right, so it would get the people that have been in the United States for their entire lives, yeah, versus, um, and then you get the kind of added, added a variation of immigrants that have actually been here for 15 years or 20 years, yeah. Overall length of residency had no effect on? 
Oh yeah, no, it, it absolutely does. Yeah, so so I I uh, I uh, left left a lot of those out, but yes, uh, immigrants in general are much uh, are are more um, uh, pro immigrant. Yeah, than. Um, than, uh, than the native born for for Asian Americans and Latinos, hmm. uh, the I haven't we haven't I don't remember that there if there was a fact for uh, white Americans, but yeah, yeah, the immigration just definitely. And, and I too, I might have missed this if you might have mm -hmm. addressed this, um, but also picking up on something that Ben mentioned, what effect is there of, of class? The point that Ben was making. Yes. Yeah. No. I mean. Th I mean. This is. Um, I think that that's a harder, this, this is kind of where, why my presentation today was supposed to be about class. Because um, I think that that one is a much, that's a much hard, that was a much harder uh, nut to crack that we really did glaze over uh, because uh, that's, that's a, a much more difficult um, relationship uh, to understand the relationship with immigration advocates. I mean, I think, um, you know, we've got um, immigrants who come in as very privileged uh, individuals, uh, we have an immigration policy that privileges uh, certain types of individuals because we have the H-1B visa, which has, uh, which um, prioritizes if you have a you know special skills, high levels of education. That's bringing over a very specific class of immigrants into the United States um, versus if they're refugee status or family reunification, right? Which is bringing in a different type. So even the institutional structures in which we bring in immigrants into the United States which then create Latino and Asian American and black communities, white communities, you know, because of native born communities down the line, right, as we kind of think about generational transition. Um, this, is a, this, is a, this is definitely for me, uh, this kind of area where I'd like to go, because I think that this is um, something that really political scientists are very poor at addressing. I think actually sociologists are a lot better at it, but. Um, but if you also, um, I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead, yeah. Um, it, you know, you had early on in one of the slides, and you said a conventional hypothesis yes. around this, that economic threat is one of the sorts of, yeah, one right. of the traditional explanations mm -hmm. for anti-immigrant attitudes among the whites. I'm just curious there, too, about the effect of the class. Right. I mean, right. whatever one may think about the problem, problematic character and the assumptions behind that theory, mm -hmm. just to continue it, you as one could hypothesize that it um, working class whites are going to feel more threatened. Right, right, Others. right. The prop, you know, one of the reasons why uh, a lot of political science has not investigated class is because when they've done the economic threat hypothesis on whites, it's not very consistent. Right. So some studies say that it is economic threat for whites, and then others would, will do a, a different study, and they'll show that there is no economic threat for whites. And so because there isn't ever a consistent finding. Uh, no one really wants, has thought that, you know, maybe we should kind of investigate this class issue because no one can actually fundamentally show that this is really about, the, about economics, right? Um, and so it, cha it kind of stops the research from happening because we can't even prove the, the one that, that they can't prove, they can't prove is, is racial prejudice. That's the, one that, that's the one that is relatively consistent across studies, across time. And so then people kind of get into kind of whites that are high prejudice versus low. You get a lot of studies of that kind of very varying whites and high and low. Uh, that in some ways does have to do with class, but in, in many ways does not because prejudice is, is a pretty um, equal opportunity uh, phenomenon um, in that way. Um, you know, so but but that that is actually one of the problems with classes is that even for whites they can't um, they can't prove that yeah um, at least consistently yeah and you have to yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> yeah super speculative question that I'll speak to like twenty years before something gets published in the way I'm about to ask. Uh, super speculative, but it deals with attitude, it deals yeah. with attitude change, and it deals with the possibility of changing attitudes. Um, there was that very controversial study that was done at UCLA about two years ago, I think with political scientists. Mm -hmm. uh, very controversial because the PhD candidate may have joked up the data. Yes. But the argument was that if you actually present to a person who has a set set of ideas, hard set of ideas regarding a particular issue, and in this case it was LGBT yes. issues, 
if it is an actual LGBT person who engages with that person in a conversation, I don't know how long, 15 minutes, 20 minutes? Yeah, it was very quick. Then there is a remarkable change, and it is a change that lasts, mm -hmm. that the change it moves from hostility to not hostility, and that the, the data's, well, the argument was that it actually persisted as a change. And I'm wondering, speculative question, is there a possibility for not doing the wrongs of that PhD right. student, but to do something like an experiment mm -hmm. where you think about attitude change and maybe register attitude change or even foment attitude change when it comes to the immigration issue? Right, 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 right. That's a good question. Um, uh, that study was doctored. <laughs> ah. <laughs> we didn't get a speech. Yeah, I know, I know. So, um, I misunderstood the word doctorate. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> um, uh, which is why we were so surprised with the result because um, he was really addressing a long standing theory in social sciences, which is contact theory. Uh, and many, you know, and this was really what we thought was the um, solution to racial prejudice, which is that, you know, you, you um, increase contact with someone that you might have negative attitudes towards, right, or prejudice towards, and that would, you know, uh, effectively help dampen, you know, because the idea, the theory was that, you know, you don't have contact with these people, so you're allowed to kind of create these negative predispositions towards um, uh, blacks or towards uh, uh, LGBT, right, individuals. Um, and uh, again, this is another one where um, study after study has tried to show contact having, uh, a, you know, happy, helping reduce prejudice, and no one can prove uh, um, consistently uh, that contact helps reduce uh, our prejudice, that you can have, actually have a lot of people out there that have a lot of contact uh, with racial minorities, uh, with people that, from their out group, uh, and you actually don't change too much uh, their uh, levels of prejudice. And you can kind of think about really that that, does, that really could happen. Because you could be, for example, having a lot of contact with someone who, you know, is, uh, you know, uh, in the service sector, uh, helping you in your own house, uh, and which we see all the time, uh, and someone would still have anti-immigrant attitudes, right, or, or racial attitudes. Um, so we we actually don't necessarily think. Uh, so to kind of go where I, I know you want to go, which is kind of practical application. We don't actually think necessarily that contact is the, so we don't think that, you know, we put a Latino or an Asian American in front of a white American right. and, they're go and they're going to be, and they're going to be pro um, uh, n Nothing suggests that that's going to help. I mean, I think what um, our research helps show um, is that there's another theory that I think I would pull from, which is that when you um, show uh, whites, um, you know, you could have described to whites that something is violating the norm of equality, right? And so we usually think about this in terms of kind of different racial appeals. Uh, if you can do a racial appeal that uh, allows triggering someone to trigger their stereotypes without someone, a white person, noticing, so this is kind of these implicit appeals, like talking about, you know, like um, urban, ur you know, these coded words like urban, and inter you know, urban people. Uh, or kind of inner city, that's the other one that they, you know, they like to use, right? But, you know, it's a way of communicating something without it being really explicitly known that it's racial. Um, but what studies have found actually pretty consistently is if you point out to, to white Americans that actually that has, uh, you know, under racial undertones, right, that allow you to communicate kind of racism, that actually white Americans will self-correct. Um, it, it's this kind of idea that it's really important actually for Americans to feel that they're not racist and they're not violating a normal equality. And so when you kind of offer these, ex, you know, these explanations about kind of what these strategies are doing to your attitudes, right, um, that we see these self-corrections. And so, you know, kind of what we're showing here is that really um, some of these, a lot of these narratives of kind of national identity, right, are in many ways cueing. Um, uh, um, uh, really um, strong in-group uh, effects that are allowing for kind of anti-immigrant uh, sentiment, right? So I think if we could also kind of get into this a prescription of uh, possibly doing something like that, right, that that actually probably might have more, right, kind of thinking about the degree to which your national identity is cueing kind of a strong kind of, uh, kind of uh, racist uh, uh, or racialized position uh, could actually be 
uh, for example, a solution, uh, I think, rather than something like contact. I had a question, but I, I did want to clarify something. My understanding of that study was not that it was a contact theory, but a persuasion theory. So I see it very differently. I mean, you can have contact in a workplace or a church all day long, but the engagement of those two people is what I thought was the crux of that. It was door to door, wasn't it? Mm -hmm, Somebody mm -hmm, came and mm -hmm. they, they spoke. Yeah, because I think you can be with people that you have negative views uh, and stereotypes about it. and never engage them, and so you, you hold on to that. But the minute you have that conversation, you actually engage. Well, he, he argued it was more persuasive if it was actually done with that type of person. So that was the, that's, that's kind of why I described it as contact, because the whole idea was it was supposed to be you having that conversation with someone who represents that identity, rather than, because he, the other per people you know, they met were not LGBT, right? They were, you know, talking about their, you know. So my question is, there was the question that we had around the late fate, mm -hmm. and it was uh, framed in a positive way. Would the outcomes be the same if you had framed it negatively? I think it was like, is your, when something good happens to somebody in your race, then you're going to benefit from I can't remember the exact way that it was framed, but if you had flipped it and said, when something negative happens, do you feel like that's affecting you or? Yeah, whatever, but the flip side of that. Oh, interesting, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, I mean, the, the way that we try to, to word those questions is to make it neutral, so that okay. to, to let the respondent kind of think about their own, the, you know, a situation in their own mind okay. about what they're thinking. If it happens to a person in their racial group, would it also happen to me? Uh, but that's actually an interesting um, test of, you know, kind of we, we make you think about like a positive thing that's happened to you versus a negative thing. Because I think arguably the theory is kind of assuming, you know, like negative things that happen to you are really what is, what generates a consciousness, not necessarily, you know, like, you know, someone congratulates you or something like that. Yeah. I mean, it's I thought about it because group. there's sort of a joke in the African American community when you see something negative on TV and you don't know the race yet, you, everybody says, oh, I hope it ain't a black person. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, I mean, I just, when I thought of, I saw that question, I thought about like if it was Birds with people feel as strong. Right, about, right. Um, that's a great question. Yeah, and actually, that that would be a great um, study. Yeah, because that was that's something I think that we haven't actually considered when you give the frame. So, I, I, I this is really um, true. The last thing you showed is the flag. Mm -hmm. I'm just I want to push back on that a little bit because my impression is not something. Yeah. Is that that's standard, especially, I mean, I immediately looked up images of Barack Obama and uh -huh. it's just flags, flags, flags. Um, but it's, maybe it's that Republicans have more flags, but it seems like, <laughs> yeah. you know, it, it's just that everybody's, you know, there was that controversy not too long ago about who was it, what candidate wasn't wearing a lapel pin? That was, it was Obama. Obama. It was Obama. 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 Um, but, you know, so it's sort of like, it's, expected that everybody is like great in the flag. Yeah. I'm wondering how is is I mean Trump is I mean hopefully yeah. you don't grow nostalgic for him or something. <laughs> but please. I know. <laughs> but you know, he's he's a departure in some significant ways. But I don't know is that really a big departure that the use of the flag is a prop? I mean, no, I mean I think, you know, you're right that we see I think uh, I think though you're right uh, I would say because I've been I've been paying attention because I think that the the multiple use of the flags for Trump I think was was exaggerated relative to other, I mean if you um, you know if you looked at Clinton I mean there weren't there weren't really as many flags if you would associate you know kind of different Clinton appearances um, of course they're using red white and blue like streamers and that kind of thing because it's a political it's a national campaign right so they're going to use red white and blue. Um, but Republicans, yeah, do use a flag a lot in their uh, ads and stuff. I mean, I, I, this is something that if, you know, if I, uh, you know, ever could convince a graduate student to do is to kind of tell me to what extent Republicans actually, in fact, are using kind of more flags versus uh, Democrats to kind of, you know, just, just over time and whether or not Trump actually was higher. I mean, but you could also say Trump was actually, you know, a lot of his me a lot of his explicit messages were also very American identity-esque. Right? I mean, it was... From 
predecessor. I mean, make yes. a character great again is explicitly great yes. Right, um, right. A lot of the stuff is being rich. Mm -hmm. um, is, you know, but I think Obama, Obama uh, overcompensated with the images of the American flag once he got accused of not, it was, it not was being not an American and not being a yeah. natural citizen. Mm -hmm. right. So that the fact that he didn't wear that pin, I think, I bet you, you will see an increase of flags after that point. Right. Because right. before then it wasn't. And then, and then the birthers. Yeah, yeah. yeah. the whole birthers. Start wearing those Muslim The president of the Can I ask a question that's yes. like totally different for me? Oh, okay, sure. Partly because I won't be able to go tomorrow. Oh, okay. So, yeah, I, I, when students in my race undergraduate classes talk about race, of white fragility and white fatigue, are, are political scientists studying this? I, I, I mean, and I, so it's just. What do you, so, what, do you, what, what, how do you, how would you actually define fragility and fragility? Well, so they, I'm, I'm really learning it from those students, actually. But this, this idea that. Uh, they tend to be in white. No. <laughs> the reason that Everybody's Trump, against us. The reason that Trump won is because, you know, whites thought, well, you know, black, uh, uh, we had Obama. You know everything should be fine, right? Fixed, and so they're just tired of hearing about race. Uh, and you know, let's just finish with the race talk. Probably. And so, and and so it's a uh, you have to handle them gently because of white fragility and white like fatigue. The fatigue is refers to being tired of hearing about race. About race. Yeah. Oh, uh, no. Yeah, no. That's no, that is. Yeah, that's not okay. quite on our okay, radar yet. Next study. Yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm learning this from the undergraduates, literally. More from them than the graduate students. So. Yeah, I mean, um, where probably I would predict political science going is um, we do find it very fascinating about how explicitly racial uh, Trump's language was because historically most racial language particularly used by Republicans is, has been coded. Uh, and it's it's indirect, right. uh, and so the theory was is that you see that uh, style, and so that was really what's activating white support for candidates. But he was able to activate white support with being very explicit, and so he's a key contrast to everything that we've been studying since Nixon. <laughs> um, and so, uh, because it, it, all the studies would, would say, right, that you can't be explicitly racial about race, because you know, as we, as I just said, you know, if you correct, you know, if you tell whites this is too, ra this is too racialized, they, they, um, they self-correct, yeah. Um, and so he showed that that's there is something about something that's transitioned in white America that actually, I mean, maybe someone will come up with a very similar theory. Mm -hmm. Something's transitioned in white America where those messages weren't something that caused people to, I mean, this, it, I might have just, you know, kind of canceled out my, my proposal about how to, <laughs> how to, how to, how to, how to, you know, kind of turn around anti-immigrant attitudes, but, um, uh, you know, he, he, there's something, there was something that was different, that's diff going, diff that's going on that's different in white America that I think that political scientists are going to be very kind of in, infatuated with because we wonder now if this is what, what is going to be the new campaign strategy for Republicans, for, you know, right? Because, I mean, Nixon Nixon kind of switched it, and then Reagan Reagan really showed that it worked. And then, the, you know, and then you see, it, you see the pattern. So now we wonder if this is like a new Republican strategy in campaigns. But you, yeah. so you're saying that part of that is that Obama successfully appealed to white people, you're saying, too. Um, it, uh, in the con it, I'm sorry. Maybe it, I missed it. I'm sorry. Somebody is trying to come. I, I should have come from that side. Oh, okay. I, I misinterpreted what you were saying. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. So, so I mean, Obama, the you know, white supporting Obama would have suggested, right, that these kind of explicit racial pills weren't going to work, right, because they supported uh, him. So then, kind of, how did we get to that switch where you can use this explicit racial switch? Um, so okay, I think I did it. Yes. So. Um, I mean, my sense of it is that it, it's hard to know exactly with the data we have so far mm -hmm. actually what why people voted the way they voted. Right, yes, yes. And there's lots of speculation about it, you know, about the white working class mm -hmm. and all that, um, even though there's lots of 
what limited data there is shows that a substantial number of the people who voted for Trump are like the classic petty bourgeois, self-employed, but not, I mean, better off. You know, people with a median income of over $70,000, um, which doesn't fit the definition of a white working class. Um, but to the degree that there is a, a segment of those folks, there has been, has there been switching or a drop in terms of the number of people who voted for Trump is roughly sim the same as the number of people who voted for Obama. Right, yes. So that doesn't suggest much of a change. Where there was a significant change was that there was a big drop between Obama and Clinton. The, the turnout, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So trying to figure out what portion of this was driven by a switch from right. Obama to Trump right. is hard to figure out. Right. Even though a bunch of counties, 700 across the country that voted Obama voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. But how much of that was a drop in turnout for the Democrat versus a switch of voters? From them, right, 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 right. To Republican. Right. So, is the appeal to whiteness actually that effective? I, I mean, I think the, L, the I mean, that that's a very good point. That uh, it was a pretty similar rate between twelve uh, and sixteen in terms of of white support. Um, uh, actually, I, we, I've, I have looked at that data, and even if you disaggregate it down, white women voted at the same, a uh, very similar way. I mean, it's like a 1% difference. Uh, white men, you know, if you kind of break down whites, uh, it's really, it's re very similar. Uh, I think, out of anything, uh, the explicit racial language did not turn off voters. So there was something right about um, the fact that you actually didn't see the decline. Right. Even with, you know, but, but the theory would suggest that uh, you know, white voters know that they're really not supposed to be supportive of this kind of language. So, you know, that that was that was what political scientists expected. That like that that is a violation of what whites are supposed to be demonstrating support for. Um, and so we would at least have expected somewhat of a decline in turnout for him. But there, it was pretty stable. Right. But there are um, a number of other interesting phenomena, which one of which was that he had the highest of those who voted for him had the highest sort of disapproval of him. Um, of him. Ever. I mean, people who cast a ballot for him disapproved of him. Mm -hmm. um, and, but it's also the case that both candidates were evaluated lower than anybody ever had. Right, right. So that they were, in many respects, at least hypothetically, um, adopting a similar logic, which was, I'm holding my nose voting for this person, but the alternative is so bad that that's why I'm doing it. And yeah. then thinking, and how could these other people vote for that person? Yeah. They were both thinking the yeah. same way. Yeah. And, I'm, and I think that, you know, one way to think about this too is that there are a substantial number of people who looked past race, white people, when they voted for Obama. And they looked past racism when they voted for Trump. That's, and, that's a possibility. I mean, my data from yesterday would suggest that they were not looking past race. I think that they were seeing race in different right. ways. Yeah. No, I mean, <laughs> everybody. I'm saying yeah. there's a certain right. segment of people. Right, we're right, right. You right. know, the, the, you know the, the, it dropped for Obama. There were, I mean, there's lots of anecdotal evidence. I mean, people I've talked to who say their parents, white people, their parents voted for Obama. And voted for mm -hmm. I just don't know how significant that is. But we know that. Obama's vote total dropped significantly from 08 to 12. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean that. that and although that's not surprising for us, since you know the, 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 that was a second that was a second election, so it's usually lower. Okay. Yeah. So I don't mean to take up so much time, but I'm just saying yeah. that it's just there seems to be a lot of interesting possibilities, but not a lot of data yet in terms of right. Right. Well, we'll have to. Well, I'll uh, we'll see if you're holding the nose theory is going to. Well, that's a very generous, that's a generous interpretation of, uh, mm -hmm. of, I, I of, the of what of happened. People, <laughs> the majority of, this is my guess, the majority of people who voted for Trump would have voted for anger. Yes, no, that is probably true. Yeah, yeah. And the majority of people who voted for Trump would have voted for anger. 
would have voted for him. Right, yes. I mean, that's, I think that's the case for most elections. Yeah. yeah, so most elections is like a negative evaluation of the alternative. Mm -hmm. So there, most people are voting. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And what was said was not enough to get people to abstain. Um, yeah. No, most people do abstain. I mean, that depends on the election. Yeah, right, right, right. Yes. I wonder what your thoughts are on why I have a strong racial identity with leads to be less anti-immigrant. I'm sorry, less anti-immigrant. Less anti-immigrant. Uh, I'm sorry, so can you, so, could you so say that one more time? For example, Asian Americans have a strong, a strong racial identity would lead them to have uh, less anti-immigrant attitudes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so, you know, I think for Asian Americans, uh, you know, the, I mean, it's, it's consistent with Latinos and, and African Americans, but, you know, this idea of group consciousness, right, which is, you know, the, um, this uh, uh, understanding of racialization, right, and, and feelings of exclusion. Uh, are, are something that kind of mediates and kind of uh, allows someone to kind of consider the um, exclusionary policies against immigrants, right, have some correspondence uh, with the type of exclusion that they're experiencing, right? So we're kind of trying to uh, make that parallel um, more explicit with, we think, what racial minorities are, are thinking, which is that, you know, when you are an excluded group and you're thinking about uh, feeling excluded, you are not necessarily going to try to impose other types of exclusionary types of policies on others, right? So this kind of this idea of, of uh, uh, kind of uh, understanding how this impact impacts others, yet yeah, your own experience. Yeah, yeah. 